Yo, yo, yo. What's up, what's up? Welcome back. Uh, today we're working on my operating system. It's an x86 operating system called StreamOS. Uh, and it's got like, uh, we're kind of like midway into the project, I guess. Um, so we have a, a kernel that like boots in a virtual machine. Uh, it has like a bit of like some demo stuff going on. So we have like this brick breaker game that requires like user input and drawing to the frame buffer. Um, we have these like logs that are that happen on startup that tell us like, hey, we're like talking to the Ethernet card and we're sleeping and we have uh, what's this called? Like clock support and uh, we have like allocation support and containers and stuff. Uh, we have, I think if I run with num cores, I think I'm on the right revision. We have multi-core support, so we like boot up the second CPU, and so we say like hello from CPU one. So we've got like multi-core support, and then if I run netcat to like open a TCP socket to my thing, I have like an echo server. So I say like hello, and he says hello back. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so that's kind of like where our OS is at. Uh, we've kind of just recently tied off multi-core stuff. And so we're kind of in like in between um, major features. And so kind of what I wanted to do today was take the opportunity to do some like cleanup that I've kind of had in my mind. Um, maybe saying take the opportunity is a little disingenuous. I didn't get as far as I wanted to reading about uh, USB, which is probably next up on the docket. And so today we're kind of just uh, looking for something else to do that's productive while I do some more of reading on that off stream. And so what I wanted to work on is it's kind of been bugging me that uh, I have this dependency on the futures crate, which is this like third party library. I don't actually know who it's written by. Let's see. Uh, you know, it's a pretty big library, all time downloads. That's 120 mil. Boom, that's a lot, man. And, you know, it's, like, pretty well respected. Uh, but it still, like, bothers me that I need it. <clears throat> I think I'm probably, like, pulling in a lot more than I'm actually using. Um, and what this guy has is he's got, like, uh, a lot of stuff. But the the big one that I've been using, it, he, he has these, like, pre-created, like, combinators, I guess you would call them. So you can, like, maybe spin off one-off futures that's that for like different things like you might have like one like a ready future where you just say future is ready and it will immediately return or um the one we were using heavily initially was like this like join future so you like put like n futures together and you get out uh the like combination of all of them it waits for all of them to complete uh yeah so Easy, uh, and so what? It, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to like see if we could remove that dependency. I'm pretty sure that I'm not using very much from here, and it would probably be quick and easy to just implement my own. Um, and you might ask like why, and uh, part of it is because it gives me like more control, uh, but part of it is because I have a severe case of like not invented here syndrome. I think it's called. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a tendency to avoid using or buying products, research standards, or knowledge from external origins. Usually, dumped by social, corporate, or institutional cultures. Research illustrates a lot strong bias against ideas from outside. Sure, whatever. Um, but really, it's like kind of like more fun as well, right? I like the idea of being able to uh, have full control, write the whole stack, etc. And this is like a fun stream, fun by some metric. Uh, so yeah, that's what I want to do first, and then uh, depending on how that long that takes. The other thing I wanted to do is in my uh, demo that we do when we start up, I always do this like netcat shit. And I think it's like a better demo if this like echo server is like an HTTP echo server that we can open up in the browser. Um, that way we can say that we support HTTP and we have an HTTP server and all that. And it just looks a little nicer. Uh, so yeah, that's what I wanted to do today. That's it. Kind of chill, chill day today. Nothing crazy happening. Uh, Alright, so the first thing I want to do is start hitting up this future crate. Get this shit out of the way. 
Uh, so probably, what do I want to do here? If I grep source directory um, for the word futures, uh, oops, wrong order. What do we see in here? We see a futures select and poll immediate. Poll function. So we're using like maybe like three functions from this entire crate. Um, so probably, I think probably the first, like let's, the, the easiest way to refactor this would just be to replace every instance of futures with crate. And that way I would go into my crates feature module and then all I have to do is re-implement the functions that I'm using. Um, so I think that you can do like, uh, find dot dash i name star rs rep futures this uh oops i forgot to say exec okay and then can i like take the first thing in here so maybe like cut with delimiter of colon the first field um how do you use cut again? Cut delimiter delimiter field field field. So I think I just do this and I should get all of the names. No, cut you can specify a list. Oh, maybe I have to say this is from standard input. Cut you must specify a list of bytes, characters, or fields. Am I crazy? Oh, maybe it's F1, not N1. There we go. So those are all the files that have features in them. And then I sort in unique. Cool. So that's like a small list. And then said out. Um, what am I doing? I'm taking features and replacing it with crate. Um, and do I do like XARGs here to like do it on all of them? Yep, and then I just say modify in place. And now here I see a bunch of changes from futures future to create future. Wonderful. So now when I build, it's gonna go, hey, you don't have these things. Um, so I can go into my future module and just start implementing them. So one of them is uh, async function select. And he takes in uh, F1 and F2. And he probably returns something. Let's see what it bitches about. <clears throat> uh, but it says it's public, so make it public. And all right, let's do poll function next. So this is poll function. He takes in some sort of function. And we'll figure out what he does later. Um, <clears throat> that is a fu function that takes in a context. Uh, so what this guy is supposed to do is uh, he's basically a wrapper around, uh, he's just like a shortcut to making your own future, right? So like when you make a future, uh, you say like, I have a struct F and I'm gonna implement F. Uh, I'm gonna implement future for F, right? And the thing that you do when you make a future is you implement this like poll function and he takes in a context and he says like, hey, I'm going to like run this function and he's going to return either like I'm going to say I'm ready or I'm not ready. Like the future is either complete or incomplete. And uh, he takes in this context. And so I think this function is just like a shortcut way to say like run this function instead of making this future. Right. So just like I would like put this stuff in a closure. Uh, which means that this guy probably has to return all uh, R. Where R is the return type. Okay. So does that compile? 
Uh, yeah, and then we also have poll immediate. I don't know what the difference is yet. I can't remember. We'll take a look in a minute. But I think the signature is the same. I guess we can actually look. Um, if I open up the documentation here, we could actually look at what poll function and poll immediate do. So poll function just returns the thing, and poll immediate... Uh, basically says that it all the thing inside must always return ready i see so it converts like a like a polled thing into an option sure that makes sense that makes sense um okay so now he's complaining that some things don't have the right output which makes sense. So here, this guy passes in a feature that returns a U8, and here we have to return uh, an option R. And here we'll return none for now, or maybe we'll write unimplemented, that's probably better. And does that fix some of the complaints? It sure does. Um, but now we have a different thing, so we have Pull immediate. Oh, he takes in a. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What does he take in? He takes in. I thought it was a function, but he takes in a future. Aha! Right, not a function. So this is pull immediate. This takes in a. Uh, this guy is a future whose uh, output. I guess we don't have. We say his output is R. The return type. And then instead of returning this like pull R thing, returns option R. Okay, that seems reasonable. Cargo check. We're a lot closer. Um, views core task pull. We don't have that imported right now. Um, this guy doesn't have the right signature. Uh, sleep.rs doesn't return the waker, so probably this guy, poll function, probably returns something. What does poll function return? A future, I guess, that pulls the function. Probably. What is this guy? Yeah, he's a future that returns... Uh, T, where F returns pull T, yep. Makes sense, so we'll just say for now this is a... Uh, he returns R. Uh, and we'll write unimplemented. For now. Okay, so we're close now. We're just missing uh, feature 109. He doesn't like this, which is okay, because I was just like, it's some demo code that we wrote. And uh, select is supposed to return either. So we'll say enum either. And we'll return either. And I think this probably has like A, B, and returns R1, R2... And then the future output is like, uh, F1 is a future whose output is R1, and F2 is a future whose output is R2. And then here we say return either R1, R2, and then we just say like, here are two options A and B, and this is unimplemented. Cargo check, do we compile? Um, he doesn't like that either is private, so we'll just make this public. And now he doesn't like that it was called left and right instead of A and B. Okay, we're close. Um, he actually returns A, B, or B, A, I think. Was the output? So he returns, like, uh... Hmm, he returns something crazy. Let's see. In the this version of the select function, he returns a select for one and two. 
and his future implementation returns some form of like either shit. Where is it? Future. Am I high? Oh, this returns a stream? Oh, oops, I'm in the wrong spot, that's why. Futures, future, select. And he return his thing. Is an either a b ah so the thing he returns is either the output I see I see so this is he returns left to right but the things in the outputs are either the first thing that was returned and the second future or the second thing that was returned and the first future there we go okay so cargo check is now passing uh and does cargo test pass as well uh close so this poll function thing takes in a uh reference to a context okay cool so um we have now covered all of the functions that the futures crate is implemented that we are using and now we just have to implement them ourselves easy peasy so we should be able to go into our cargo terminal and just be like Bye bye futures crate, which still compiles. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. And like, let's just quickly look at like what the difference there is. So if I uh, open up my cargo toml and I, oops, uh, let's just add that back in. This guy here. Uh, cargo tumble. So here I say, I think it's cargo tree shows me the dependency graph. Yeah, so I've basically knocked out all of this, which is kind of sick. Kind of sick. Yeah, pretty sick, pretty sick, pretty sick. Um, and now all I have to do is implement these functions. Easy. So let's start with, uh, hold on. Uh, this is task pull is what I was trying to import here. Uh, so select, we take in two futures, F1 and F2, and we return whichever finishes first. Um, so, um, what they do is they don't make this an async function, actually. They make this a function that returns a select future. And maybe there's a reason for that, so I might just do that myself. Um, and I, I would have to do this anyways, because making it, like, doing the polling here is, like, easier from doing it this way than writing an async function. So let's do this. Uh, so our select... He's going to have two futures, F1 and F2. He's going to say F1 is F1 and F2 is F2. Great. And what's he going to do? He's going to implement future. So implement future for F1, F2, uh, where F1 is a future and F2 is a future. That seems reasonable. Um, and then I say, please implement this thing. So we need to pull in the context here. Context and pull, great. And what's this guy going to do? He's going to have an output of uh, either, like, this shit show of a thing. Um, and then we have to say r1, r2. Future output equals r1. Future output equals r2. There we go. Okay, so what do we do on poll of this like select feature? We have like two features and we want to say which one finished first. Um, I guess on each poll, we just say uh, if let 
poll ready is equal to uh, self dot f one dot poll. Um. So if poll one is ready, we return either left and we return, what is it? The output, so ret and the remaining future. Otherwise, uh, well, first let's like fix all this compile issues. So return poll ready. The thing is finished. We have completed, so we are ready. And he doesn't like that it's not pinned. Can we just pin it? Um, maybe... That's not allowed. Uh, so what do they do? They say that their thing has to take unpin. Uh, so we can just say on all of these... Unpin and unpin. And I think that allows us to just like, yeah, take it by mutable reference and pin it. So what we have like, let f1 is self dot f1 pin new, take this by mutable reference or something. And then we do f1 poll like this. Is that right? That seems reasonable. Cannot move this guy out. So uh, when we return, since we return the other future, we need to like extract him and like replace. He might not be copyable. So we just have to stick him in an option here, I guess. And then what we do is we say uh, let f2 is core mem take f2. Okay, um, and expected F2 to be valid. That seems reasonable. Um, what doesn't he like now? So he doesn't like that uh, F1 is an option. So here we'll say let F1 is equal to pin new. Since we've created, turned this into an option, we to say self.f1.as mute uh, expect expected f1 to be valid then we can pull him then we return him great and then we just do the same thing uh but in reverse so we say uh f2 is f2 we do pull him and then we return f1 instead of f2 as the backwards thing there we go so we just pull each one independently. Um, yeah, that seems reasonable. Uh, and our output here what doesn't it like? Mismatch types. Oh, because this needs to be either right. There we go. There we go. So we just pull both of them independently. And then if neither of them are ready, we return poll pending. Otherwise, we return the one that's ready. Great. And uh, this like extraction of the value from the inside, that should be totally safe. Because um, if this is returned ready, it's, we're not allowed to call it again. And the executor should hold that constraint up. Very cool, very cool. Uh... So now we just create this like select thing. We don't make an async function now. We return select f1, f2. Uh, we need to make this struct public. And then we just say select f1 is sum f1 and f2 is sum f2.
Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Does that compile? It does. And maybe what would be nice is if we could like test this in some way before implementing them all, just to get like some form of like intermediate progress. So I wonder if what makes sense is we can actually keep the old implement the future dependency in for a second. Uh, so we can just look here, pull this guy back in. And in our implementation, we just pull, go call the other version. So we say futures, future, pull, function, f. Like this. And we say future, future, pull, immediate f. Cargo check. I think that should compile. I don't see a reason why I wouldn't. Uh, right, so... Um, we can say impl, this returns an impl future whose output is an option R. And this should, is the same. This is a returns an impl future whose output is R. And then these should compile, I think. Cargo check. Let's see it. Great, let's compile. And if I cargo run now, hopefully our select implementation is good enough uh, that we don't see any like major mistakes here. And what we should probably do is we should probably look at who calls this guy. Uh, so we are still running. Cool. And who uses this guy? So we can actually just go in here and we can say, who uses you? And it seems like there's only one usage and it's in the ARP lookup for the MAC address. So um, if I make this sleep feature like 0.01, Hopefully that will see like a MAC address timeout. Oh, he re resolves it very fast. Uh, how can we hack this? We can just make this a uh, ARP ready future, just always return pending. And then what we should see is that we should see uh, our ARP Resolution failed. Nice. ARP lookup for this guy failed. And if we put him back to the way he was, his ARP lookup uh, resolves. Um, so it looks like our select thing is working correctly. It's like in this where we like either sleep or we get the MAC address, we do get the right log out. So it looks like this is working which is pretty sick. Very cool, very cool. Um, so we'll say select future replaced and that took around 28 minutes. Okay, so the next one is a poll function future poll function implementation. And so that's just this guy who's thing is what boom, 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 boom. creates a new function wrapping around a function returning a new future wrapping a function returning pull pulling the return future delegates the wrap function yeah so it's just a very simple implementation i think so we just have a struct pub struct pull function f and here it says f is an f which is going to be a function this time not a future we implement future for pull function, easy, and we take the auto-generated thing. His output is going to equal, uh, here, let's see. So here we need to start putting in some types here. So we'll say take an R and F, and we'll say where F is a function that takes in a context, and he returns a pull r. Now we can say that our output is an r. Um, and our pull implementation just says call the function. I think I have to put brackets around this. And that's like the easiest implementation of all time. Look at that. Fucking easy peasy. Easy peasy. So now I can make it so that this guy returns a uh, pull function f. And we can just say uh, 
pull function and F. And uh, that looks good. Um, so we can cargo check again. And maybe cargo test. Give it a second. Everything's passing. And, uh, oopsies, what did I just do? And then cargo run to see if we have any problems left over. Everything looks like it's working. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong. Um, maybe we can look at for people who call this function. Async channel, so sleeps use him. Uh, and we know our game loop is using sleeps quite heavily, so I think that we have pretty good indication that's working correctly. Our tests are passing. Great. And we'll just do the same thing for poll immediate, where poll immediate should be pretty straightforward as well. So we're going to take in poll, and we're going to make a poll immediate output who takes in a future this time, not a function. And his input now is a... Uh, Future whose output is an R, where R stands for return. Our output is now an option R. And all we do here is, uh, I guess we also have to say that this is a unpin. I think. I actually don't know what this unpin is for. I can't ever remember. I think it's like if I pin something in memory and then use it and then take it out later... Uh, there's to be like some guarantee that like the inner contents will not move or something. I'm not really positive that I need this, but uh, the implementation for him uses it, I think. Uh, let's see, pull immediate. Oh no, he does just say all he takes is a future. He doesn't need to implement unpin. Okay. So I won't do that. Did I did I say that people need unpin other places that I didn't need it? Let's just uh, rely on the type system to tell us if we're fucking this up. Uh, yeah, they do say that they need him. Uh, okay, so here our poll immediate. Um, maybe he doesn't need unpin. We'll see. And we just say uh, I think he does. We'll say he does for now. Because I think that what happens is they have this, like, pin new in uh, the Rust standard library. If I remember correctly, pin new. Yeah, he requires this guy to be unpinnable, which makes sense. Um, because the safe interface requires it. And so I think that we just say pin new mute self f. So we say let f is equal to the pin version of this. We pull him once with our context. And we say, um, if we're ready, we return some value. We got it. Hooray. Otherwise, we are pending and we didn't get anything. And I guess both of these have to say uh, be wrapped with pull ready. To say, yes, we got our value. And the reason that we do, like, this exists, I'm pretty sure, is um, this is the only way to get a reference to, like, this context, which is, like, useful in some cases. And so here, we're just saying, like, yeah, yeah, we'll, like, act like a future so that you give us the pieces that we need, but then we'll just, like, immediately return. And this is useful if, like, um, like our mutex type, he has a lock function, uh, and if we wanted to, like, temporarily attempt to lock the mutex and give up after one iteration for, like, a unit test or something, we can, like, use poll immediate instead. Now, here we happen to implement this, like, try lock function, but if we could just not implement that and do poll immediate instead. Um, okay, so here we have poll immediate is our output, and he just takes an F. Cool. And... This guy also needs an unpin on him. Auto check. What's he angry about? The trait 
unpin is not implemented for that guy. So let's look at that. PS2. What the fuck? Why is my syntax highlighting all fucked up? Uh, probably because I accidentally pasted something. Yeah. Okay. So who calls this guy? It's here. This poll immediate. He says handle input. Read. So can I say uh, read is equal to self like core pin pin self dot ps two dot read or something, and then pass in the read thing here. Yeah, he seems to like that better. Cool, 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 cool. Cargo test maybe? Does cargo test pass? No, because a lot of people have this like unpin thing. So it'd be nicer to f actually fix this unpin. Is there a way to do this where we don't need to implement unpin on this guy? What do they do in their implementation? They have this uh, poll immediate. Okay, so they just take the inside out. That seems reasonable. Because then they can pin him. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So here we just say, you are an option. We might, you might be there, you might not be. And we can say, let f is equal to self dot f dot take. And we can say let f is equal to core pin pin f, and then we should be able to pull him. Uh, and we should say expect a pull immediate pulled after completion, which should not be allowed. And then we say here f is sum f. Um, okay, so what doesn't he like now? Hold on. Cannot borrow as mutable. Oh, uh, so that's what this, like, project is. Hmm, because, like, the whole point of a pin thing being pinned is that you can't, like, remove... You can't get a mutable reference to its insides or something. Um... Right, that's... That is right. So what is this fucking pin type again? I have to read this every time. So here they talk about... It is useful to have objects that are guaranteed to not move in the sense that their placement of memory does not change. Yep. By default, all types in Rust are movable, and so the pin type like avoids that. Where do they talk about like projection? Here we go. When working with pin structs, the question arises how one accesses the fields of the struct in a method that takes just pin and mute struct. The usual approach is to write helper methods, so-called projection, that turn pin and mute struct into a reference to the field. But what type should that reference have? Is it pinned or is it not pinned? Um, it turns out that's up to the author. And, okay, so you can just write all this. Okay, yeah, this seems reasonable. Um, so I just say, let mute f is self dot get unchecked mute. But both of these take self by reference. Uh, let's see. Pin, 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 pin. Get mute. So this guy takes, he consumes himself totally. Why are they able to do that? Get unchecked mute. Oh. I see. Okay, so they say, uh, let self is e self mute is equal to s 
pin as mute. Self. Oh, wait, no, this isn't a reference. Okay, so we can't do that. So we say, uh, let mute f is equal to self dot get unchecked mute. Oh, and we'll call this what? Uh, self mute. And this is on safe, but that's okay. Consider removing uh, sure, and then here we just say self-mute everywhere we used self before. This doesn't have to be mutable. This doesn't have to be mutable. And that should be fine. That should be fine. I think. Maybe not. I've There's a good chance that I'm, like, fucking this up. But I'm pretty sure that, like, uh, the guarantee that this feature is going to stay in the same memory location is, like, not is not like broken by this uh, because I only call it once we only ever pull it one time and so it should be pretty hard to like to break that guarantee okay uh, so now if I cargo test does everything pass they sure do uh, so I think I think that's all we need to do in order to just nuke this dependency Very cool, very nice. Um, so we'll just say that this was finished at around 42 and, or, oh, sorry, 41 minutes into stream and like 55 seconds. All right. Yo, yo, what's up? What language am I using? We are using Rust. Rust, 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 which is like, the internet meme of people it's like a uh, arch linux users but for programming languages you know they go like oh we love rust it's a, everybody should use rust you should use rust even if you didn't ask that's the that's the meme oh uh, you're quite new to coding yeah okay so a bigger a better breakdown for someone who's new is uh there's kind of like High level and low level languages. Python, I would consider quite high level, right? That's like you don't need to worry about like memory management. You have like, uh, you just like write code and it like does what you want, I guess. Uh, Rust is kind of more like uh, this the lower level languages like C, C, uh, where you have to like you there's less going on that you didn't explicitly ask it to do, right? So, like Python, when you like create a variable it'll just like disappear at some point and the garbage collector will grab it and he'll say like, oh, you're done with that. Let me get rid of that for you. Uh, where in Rust, it's like everything is like a lot more explicit. You know exactly, you could like predict exactly how the program will run. Um, and that's kind of nice for OS dev, essentially. Um, but the, the higher level languages have like their own benefits. Like it's simpler and faster to get shit done. I studied in high school, but I find it useless in school since they spent so long on easy stuff, so I started watching Harvard courses. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's fun to just start writing as well. Just, like, make something. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, the easiest way to learn is just start punching some code into the computer. And that's why I'm here, writing an operating system. It's because I just want to know how it works, you know? All right. So we've done the first thing that we wanted to do, which is like remove that dependency. Uh, and the next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to like fix our little demo. Uh, where like our kernel, when we run it, uh, he has this little TCP echo server. So I say like, I'm gonna open a TCP port to this guy. And I'm gonna say hello. And he finds the word hello and he sends it back. Great. Um, and that's not a very good demo because I always have to remember how to like punch the port in and shit. Um, but also, uh, I can't write that in our like supported list of features that we support HTTP web servers. And it's like, I want to be able to write that down. So the other thing I wanted to do today was just convert this like TCP echo server into one that like I can run in the browser. Um, so first thing we want to do though, is we want to like save all of this work that we just did. So let's um, commit and we'll say checkpoint futures 
removed. Now, usually I would write a better commit message than this. Um, and I would like run my lint turn. I'd make sure that like all these lints pass and stuff. I'm just not going to do that right now because it's like uh, something that I can do quickly later off stream easier. Um, and it's kind of boring. Um, so, okay. Now what I want to do, HTTP echo server. So we do have like this thing that we did in the past. Where is it? Sorry, I'm having trouble finding my windows. Uh, where we did do this like HTTP proof of concept. Uh, and we didn't really like where it ended up. Let's see if I can find the video that we did this in. This guy. <clears throat> What's so up? we, oh my god, shut up, old Mick. Uh, we made this like, we tried to make this like web server that visualized our memory allocation state. Um, and that like kind of worked. We kind of proved that we like, could write an HTTP server, um, but uh, the memory allocation state visualization was kind of lame. It wasn't. It didn't really do anything of value. So we just didn't commit this. We kind of like left it in its own branch. Um, but it does mean that like I have the bones of an HTTP server in there that I can just kind of pull out probably. Um, yeah, let's just see what we did there. Proof of concept HTTP server. Um, so this stuff is like, we added a little HTML page to serve. Um, we changed some stuff in our allocator to pull out some data, but that's not what we actually want here. Here's what we want is we changed our TCP listener to go from port 9999 to port 80 so the browsers could connect to it. Great. Um, and then we use this, we call this like handle HTTP request function. And probably if I just yoink this stuff, probably all of this, that's probably all I need to start serving. Um, here I did a bunch of stuff in the TCP connection stuff. Oh, right, because I needed to update my TCP socket um, to close, uh, because the way that the HTTP server or like the HTTP client knows that the connection is complete is like my TCP socket actually closes and I just never close my TCP socket. Um, so probably it makes sense to take these changes, um, and just take everything for TCP and main is probably what I'm going to do. So I wonder if I can just like grit, like cherry pick these changes on top and have them apply cleanly. Uh, so let's just do get cherry pick this guy. And we're gonna merge tool. And this is my very complicated merge tool. I've actually uh, regressed over time. I used to use like nice little three pane merge tools and over time i just found that i actually just prefer getting these like looking at the merge directly which is like so fucking stupid i understand that it's like obviously not the right answer um but it's one of those things where it's like as i get more into the tools i like i find it like actually easier to think about this way which is just the way it is um so i'm going to keep everything in these files from uh, my current state. I'm not going to take any of the changes. Um, in main, I'll probably, I'll take what I had before from my imports and patch up the failures later. Uh, or maybe I'll just take them both. So do I have like anything from Alec in here already? I do. Um, so here I added some string stuff and some and format so i'll just pull that in here i also took in rcrc but i think that i'm using arc now so i don't think i need that um, because i want my stuff to be like multi-thread safe so i'll just take this and i'll take format and uh everything else should be the same and that's the only merge conflict great here uh we used to take uh, our, in our current state, we take an arcuate. In their state, we take a connection message. So I guess the connection message is probably the thing that we started using to flag closes of TCP sockets. So we'll keep that. 
Here, uh, we also want the connection message. And in our connection message, we probably need to upgrade this to be uh, multi-core thread safe. Because before it was, this was written at like the time before we had multiple core support. So I think that's fine. I'll just swap that for an arc, for, from an RC to an arc. And now almost certainly something I broke something with that change. So let's just do a quick cargo check. Um, in TCP RS, I missed a merge conflict. Uh, so what is in this TCP frame params? Hmm. I guess I'll just take current and deal with the follow later. Uh, what the fuck? Uh, get diff current state. Uh, so we said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold the phone for a second. So in TCP, let's look at these changes. So here, what did they do? Oh, we added in the parameters. Let's look at what we did in like the original change. Could I please explain what I'm making and what's for? Uh, I'm just making an operating system and uh, for fun, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, uh, when you boot your computer, you run like Windows, OS X, or Linux, and it does like a lot of the heavy lifting of like, you say like, I want to talk to the internet, right? I want to like open a TCP socket. And you like ask the OS to like make a TCP socket for you. And I'm like just trying to say like, well, what, what goes on behind the scenes there? What's the operating system providing to us? And I'm kind of hoping that if I get to the point where I've like implemented enough of an operating system that I'm doing something useful, uh, that I'll have like a better intuition about what happens on like normal computers. That's kind of what we're trying to do. Uh, and then along the way, we're just trying to do, you know, have fun as we go. So this like making an HTTP server here is not really like doing anything of value, but I just kind of want it to be there. Okay, so in our changes to the TCP server, we didn't change anything about TCP params before. Oh, we did here. So we switched from... I see. So we just saved the params instead of the data. So I do probably want to take that change. Uh, all right. And does the user of this guy probably... Uh, there's probably going to be something that compi fails to compile there, but that's okay. Yeah, you know, there's a lot here. So here on our allocator, uh, we didn't want to take any of the changes to the allocator that we did last time, so we'll just nuke those guys. Um, in main, we don't. We need to change what our HTTP server is doing. So here we were previously in our last thing that we did. We like returned allocation state, and we'll just not do that. Great. And here, our async channel stuff changed. What changed here? Why is this different? So we were pushing something back to this async channel. Um, and now the fields are different? Why, what changed? Why did I change this? Oh, I just added this try send thing. Am I using try send anywhere? Ah, I am because the so both because um when my TCP connection dies, I try to close it, but if the other end has already dropped, then I can't. So it's like a try send thing, and this just looks a little different than it did back then. So I think I just write Q here. All right. So we compile, and uh, maybe if I cargo run, let's like see if the uh, HTTP server like is doing something sane. Yeah, okay. So we are back back in the state where we can serve an HTTP connection. 
Wonderful, 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 wonderful. And so now all we have to do is like convert uh, the code that we had before to serve this page uh, into something that's like an echo server. Oh, cool. You're hoping to learn coding in the next few years and go into Roblox. Roblox is super fun. Um, I used to work at this company where uh, we did like uh, 3D, like finding an object in 3D and picking it up with the robots. And yeah, it's so satisfying. Um, it's so satisfying watching those guys move. It's pretty fun. There's a lot of other stuff too, but yeah, robots are cool. I worked in firmware as well at this like camera company and it's like, that's not like really robotics. Um, but there's like a lot of like lens and motor movement and stuff. And there's something like just really, really satisfying about, uh, like writing code and seeing something physically move. I worked on these like pan tilt zoom cameras and it's so fun to be like, you click on the screen and you're like, I want to, I want to like look at this thing on the screen and the camera just like zoop, goes over there. It's so sick. It's so sick. Really fun stuff. So yeah, would recommend if that's what you're interested in. Okay. Um, so I have an HTTP server and now all I have to do is like make it do something fun. So let's pull open. Uh, I had an index here and I guess my index is just gonna be, let's like kinda remove everything in here cause it's not gonna do anything right now. We're gonna say, uh, Hello from, from stream OS kernel. And do these divs line up? Yes. And probably what are we going to do? We're having like an input uh, type equals text or something. HTTP input, HTML input, sorry. Um, and my input type is going to be text, yeah, which is the default value, so I can just write input. And I probably need, like, an ID on it. ID equals, uh, echo. Okay, so if I reload this now, obviously if I reload it, nothing's gonna happen because my OS isn't running. Let's run the OS. And refresh. Cool, so I have a text box to write into, and now, uh, probably, so there's two ways I could do this. I could, like, make some JavaScript glue to, like, take the input in this box and send an HTTP request to my server, or I think that there's, like, the old-style, like, web 1.0 form submission thing, which is probably what I want to do, because... Uh, I don't think I need JavaScript for this. So I have a form, and then I say my action is, like, send shit to this place. And I have, like, inputs. Great. And then a button that they just know is, like, is just automatically connected. Maybe? How does this work? When the form is submitted using the post method, you get no data. HTML submit form. Oh, input type equals submit. Aha, 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 aha. There we go. So I make a form, it looks like. Uh, and then I have like an input type equals submit. Okay, and then I think that, is that like enough? Is that enough? See ya, have fun. Um, okay, so if I go here and I say hello and I hit submit. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> okay, so why does it say uh-oh? What did that do? <laughs> uh, That's funny. Um, so I have this form, and I guess I want the action to be go to some address, so we'll say, like, um, we'll just call it form for now, and, 
if I refresh this, I have like, hello, I submit my query. And here I did have a get request to form. And it doesn't look like I have the data that I wanted to echo back in there. So I've got to look at why that is. Uh, probably because I have to set the name here. Uh, so name equals input, I guess, or data. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we refresh, we go back, and we say hello. Uh, oops, maybe I have to refresh this to get the new thing. So now I did say for, get form data equals hello. So it looks like what happens is uh, if I do it with a get, I... Uh, get my like data with from within the query string. So I think that probably I can just uh, Let's see what happens if I try to put some other stuff in here. So I'll be like hello question mark space ASDF Something uh, So we get like URL encoded data And so I guess the thing to do is to just serve back the initial page and do I really want to like handle URL encoded parsing? If I post this, is it like easier somehow? Uh, so how do I do that again? The form thing has like a, he has a way to make me post instead of get. Where did I see that? method equals post. So what's that look like if I do it this way? So I can say, hello, question mark space ASDF, submit query. So what did I get here? I got still URL encoded params, just like within the body of the message instead. Ah, that's not any better. Ah, ah. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just revert to doing an HTTP get. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I guess we will try to parse the query param. So here are, we're going to say that the uh, URI is the part or the like path is going to be separate from the params, right? And we're going to say URI split first, uh, split at, and we're going to just say uh, URI dot position, uh, and we say the byte is equal to. The character question mark. Okay, uh, is that right? Can I? Do, is there just like a better split at where I can like split at a character? Let's look at the uh, what is this like a U8 slice? Is that what this guy is? Oh yeah, there's a split function. This is what I'm looking for. So URI is a U8 slice. So let's look at just like slice. I guess is probably the documentation that I want for this. And he has split, but I want like, is there like a split once, split first? So this split returns an iterator. Split first is the one I want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Returns the first and the rest of the elements in the slice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here I just want a split first. And he returns an option, none if empty, so elements. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So here, um, we say split first. We say, say split the first time you fucking see. Oh, wait, no. This is not what I want. Fuck. This is the split first. I want, like, the split first time I see something. Uh, is there really no simpler, like, I just don't want the iterator. Split.
split n. We're limited to at most n items. I guess I will we'll just do split n. That seems reasonable. So split n. Um, I want maximum two items. And right, the first one is the URI, and the second one would be the query params. And the predicate is uh, the byte that we get is equal to question mark. And we'll say let URI is equal to URI items next. Uh, expect should always get at least one element. And the params are going to be the one after that. Great. Cool, 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 cool. And we'll just call this path instead of URI. And now we can say if we get form, we can say uh, dot form with query params params. Wonderful. And uh, we'll just put a. I guess we can actually make this the response. So we'll just say, uh, got query, got form request with params, params. And I guess we put this guy as like a debug thing. Cool. So if I run this now, We should see when I submit that form, I can say, hello, got request with params, this guy, very cool. And I guess I should say, um, let's make this a string, core stir from UTF-8 unchecked, because I don't really feel like doing the validation which ripe for issues, I'm aware, but we're gonna ignore that for now. And we're just gonna say, uh, params and wrap. Also ripe for issues, but I don't care for now. So let's cargo check. Um, he doesn't like this is unsafe, so we'll just check this in that unsafe. And cargo run release. And so here we say, hello, there we go. Now, I guess, do I think this is good enough? <laughs> right, like I could try to like clean this up, uh, but really if all I'm trying to prove in my intro demo is that we have an HTTP server that does something, I think probably just going to this and saying hello here, um, and saying that we got that, that's actually like a plenty good enough answer, <laughs> right? If we're just, if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, uh, do I care about the polish to making this look better? And the answer is no. Um, so I think I'm gonna call it there. That gives me kind of like some time to do some more reading about USB before tomorrow. Um, so I think the plan is tomorrow I'm going to uh, hopefully have this stuff polished up enough so that it's like part of like the normal normal OS. I want to do some reading tonight about uh, USB implementation and then hopefully tomorrow we can just start whacking it at one out. Um, kind of like the long term long term goal here is that I want to get like mouse support working so that I could like play the brick baker game by moving the mouse around instead of moving the keyboard. I think that'll be kind of fun. And so I want to have like USB mouse support because. I think that's more realistic than PS2 mouse support. Uh, yeah, so that's it for today. If you liked what you saw, there's like a YouTube channel that you can catch up with on if you miss. So that's linked in the Twitch description. Um, I stream most days around like one or two o'clock Pacific time and I try to go for like one or two hours. Um, and so if you're watching on YouTube and you wanna catch me live, say hi, come chat about whatever. Um, there's a Twitch link in the YouTube description. So yeah, thanks for watching. Catch you in the next one. Bye.